Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Interfaith Paths to Peace. This is our Soul Centric City program that we are launching actually uh, this month. It's uh, a program that Interfaith Paths to Peace is, is cultivating. What would it look like if we created a soul centric path and practitioners to help Louisville and our uh, residents be whole? So it's a it's kind of a huge project, but so important um, to help us uh, understand the the journey of being human and how we do that from a soul centric perspective. We are launching today with a conversation with spiritual directors. So thanks for joining us. If you're joining us on Facebook, um, if you have questions, you're welcome to put those in the chat box. We also have folks that are here on Zoom, and later on, we'll be inviting you into the conversation. So I want to thank you for joining um, this program, and welcome to what I think is going to be a, a great conversation. A little information, um, if you want to support the Soul Centric City program, all of our events are free, but we do encourage folks to, to give a donation, and you're welcome to go on Interfaith Paths to Peace. And uh, you can find a link there. We're encouraging, we're trying to get 100 people to give $25 a month to support this initiative that will go for the next two years, actually. So if you're interested in that or just want to give a donation, uh, feel free to do that on Interfaith Paths to Peace webpage. And we would uh, very much appreciate that. Again, my name is Judd Hendricks. I work with Interfaith Paths to Peace and want to welcome you to uh, Tending the Spirit, a panel conversation with local spiritual directors. You're in for a, a treat in our time together. So uh, I'm, we're going to jump straight in. We've got, um, I'm not going to introduce all of our panelists. I'll allow them to do that. Um, what I would like for you to do, if you're listening we not only want to have a, a conversation about spiritual direction, but we actually kind of want to practice that. One of the questions that was coming to me is, um, what does the spirit want to do in and through this conversation? So those of you that are listening, as, as people are speaking, um, tend to your own heart. Um, in fact, I'll invite us just to take a minute, um, if you're joining us on Facebook or Zoom, Take a couple of deep breaths, just kind of, I know you guys have been busy today. Um, you're probably coming from a lot of different places. Um, one of the best ways I think to open up to the spirit, that which connects us is to drop into our bodies, to be present to ourselves. So I'll take some deep breaths. One of the beautiful things about spirit is it connects us beyond time and space. And so even though we are meeting on Zoom, if we will open up our hearts and our awareness, we can be present to each other, even though that we're not necessarily physically present. And so just kind of take a moment to be present to yourself um, and begin to open up Open up your heart, open up your spirit to connect to the other people that are here and then connect to that deeper wholeness that connects all of us. And I wonder if in our conversation uh, today, we can listen to each other, but we can also listen to what's deeper, what what wants to emerge in this conversation. Those of you that are joining us on Zoom after we've got a couple of rounds of questions, I will open it up to you um, to join in the conversation. And the way I would like for you to join into the conversation is by, by saying or starting with what came up for me while I was listening was this. Um, and then let's see if we can kind of get the conversation going about what's emerging to, in us in the present, um, in this moment. So again, welcome in a, a, a deeper sense of welcome. The conversation today is uh, simply 
trying to understand and explore what is spiritual direction um, and try to get a, a sense out of how do spiritual directors understand themselves? What, how do they understand their work? And um, what is the role of, of spiritual direction in the healing and holding of our city? And um, specifically, one of the questions I will be interested in is what's the connection between individual spiritual direction and collective spiritual direction. The cultivating a soul centric city is asking, um, how do we cultivate the soul of our city? Um, not just for individuals, but our collective soul. And, and what's the role of spiritual direction and social change? So those are gonna be some of the threads that we uh, kind of tease out today. So let's begin, and I'm going to have a call on our, our panelists to speak. And the first kind of question for our panelists is just introduce yourself to the group and share a little bit about your understanding of yourself as a spiritual director. How's that connected to some of your story? Um, and, and yeah, what are some of the tools that you use in spiritual direction? So let's jump in, and I'd love to turn it over to Shonda Irvin. Uh, who's a, a, a good friend and amazing. She's actually, um, Chandra, I'm going to introduce you because uh, just earlier this week, Chandra and I took a walk across the bridge and she practiced some spiritual direction with me, even though it, it may have been mutual, but it felt like it was more for me. So Chandra, I introduce you as one of the people that uh, often uh, journeys with me in my, my spiritual formation. So thanks for being on today. Thanks so much. Um, Judd, it's a pleasure to be here with you and with the panelists and all the people who are joining us in this conversation today. Um, so uh, you asked for us to introduce ourselves. So I will say to those of you who I don't know that, uh, again, my name is Chandra uh, Goforth Urban, and I, am, uh, I have the privilege of serving as the Executive Director for Peace and Spiritual Renewal at Spalding University. Um, and um, our community for peace and spiritual renewal specifically focuses on facilitating individual and collective journeys towards common ground, common ground within oneself and common ground with one another. Uh, and Judd, as you were just talking about uh, what does it mean in uh, terms of a city, one of the things that uh, connected with me, as you said, that was that we have to have, um, one of the things that facilitates that is a common goal or common vision and being able to really determine what, is, what does it really look like when we are a soul-centric city. Um, all right, back to my introduction. I am uh, peace. And a few years ago, I coined a term called sacred innate identity, that part that is us when we strip away everything else, all of our associations, affiliations, achievements, failures, et cetera, et cetera. And everything is stripped away. What remains and why are we here? And so I know that I am here. And if the divine was calling me, the divine, as the divine calls me, I am called to peace. So um, now for this, for me, peace means being in, honoring, and cultivating relationship, a kindred relationship with God, with self, and with other. Um, and aligning uh, with God, self, and other. Um, it also means peace, um, <laughs> means for me that I have to sometimes be a disruptor because there's no true peace without some disruption. Uh, anything else is, uh, you know, it's temporary, it's fading, it's, not um, genuine. So for me, uh, I need to also sometimes be a disruptor um, because I really want genuine peace. And my perspectives are formed by a few things. One, first of all, uh, I am a, so as, as you hear me speak, this is where I'm gonna be coming from. I'm a Jim Crow um, 
era baby uh, from the South, which has informed and uh, am, impacted me in a number of different ways, but it has led me to a commitment to build race relations um, and human relations in general are really important to me, but race relations in particular is one of the areas where I focus. Um, I am also informed by uh, my cultural and spiritual tutors, my parents um, and my ancestors who taught me about being dutiful to justice and faithful to love at the same time. Um, by Christian tenets that guide me to love as a touchstone and um, barometer for my life. And um, my personal experience, my personal relationships with life and love and the divine also inform my perspective. And then finally, and also important, um, are my formal training um, in uh, my MDiv and uh, Masters of, of uh, Education with Cognitive and Counseling and Coaching um, Certification and Polarity Thinking. All of those things wrapped together in a package as I'm doing um, spiritual coaching, direction, et cetera. And, um, I'll, I'll leave space for other people. I can talk about tools a little bit later on. Thank you, Chandra. Welcome mm -hmm. to the conversation. Carl Rutan, thank you. Carl helped actually pull this uh, conversation together. So Carl, thank you for doing that. And uh, please introduce yourself. Thanks for being in the, in the space. Well, thank you, Judd, for putting this together. And thank you, Chandra, for your words. So uh, my name is Carl Rattan. I am a retired Episcopal priest doing spiritual direction, uh, actually, uh, either on Zoom or out of the Church of the Advent, and um, lived in Louisville for about seven years. So what's really core to me is um, no knowing what's in the heart of another, uh, really connecting with people on a deep, deep level, that often with the superficialities of life, we can, we can miss. And so I love to listen to people. I love to listen to their stories. There's a, a number of people say that listening is an act of love. And in our time of a, a deeply troubled world, how much, how important listening is. I, I'm interested in the language that Judd used of being a soul-centric city. What does it mean to be soul-centric? And I believe he used language like tending to the soul. Isn't that a great expression, tending to the soul? I actually like what Chandra said about that too, about uh, kind of looking, moving beyond all the externals and really looking into uh, taking all that away and looking into the essence of a being. And that, and, and I heard Chandra saying that's where she finds peace. Yeah, indeed, when we find our center, our rootedness. I think a lot of my own experience comes from the fact that uh, after college, I lived in Chicago for a while and was an activist uh, doing social justice work. And although my faith was very important, more than that, I should say, my faith was probably leading me to my social justice work. I found that over time, I was becoming so frustrated that um, at, the, at the state of the world that I was becoming angry and disconnected from my own soul. And that's where I had to back up and, and slow down and listen as a, as a, as a, um, to listen to God. Um, I, I want, I use the word God, of course, because it's important to me, but I understand it's not important to everyone. And in spiritual direction, what we're really listening for is again, what's in our heart, what's in our soul, what gives our life meaning, how do we find our deepest inspiration, what keeps us going? Those are really important questions. Um, so I, uh, I've always been interested because I was interested in what makes people tick, what really gives their life meaning or direction or purpose. And um, so I studied as an undergraduate psychology and that was somewhat satisfying, but I really felt that something was missing. When I lived in the Pittsburgh area, I 
uh, discovered a wonderful program at Duquesne University, which blended a deep faith and spirituality with psychology uh, at the Institute of Formative Spirituality under the um, leadership of uh, Adrian von Kamm, who is a Roman Catholic priest. And that brought it all together. I really began to understand in a new way how we are shaped by the divine, the holy. In the language of my training, we talked about the mystery of formation and how that how um, important it is for us to connect with our deepest source. And um, that's for me what it's all about. Um, it's interesting to think about the question too, about how do we go from that individual to the, um, to the community? And uh, again, I love Judd's word, language about tending to the soul. Uh, the work we do in spiritual direction is definitely tending to the soul. It's a person that really wants to be intentional about connecting to their deepest source. But how do we do that as a city? That's a really intriguing question to me. And uh, I think maybe we can learn from uh, our uh, some of our what we do as spiritual directors. But I think I'll leave that for our conversation as we go forward. And uh, I think I'll stop at that point. Thanks, Carl. Appreciate you being here and helping pull together this conversation. Lois Luckett, would you mind um, uh, mute, unmuting yourself and um, bring yourself into the conversation? A joy to have you here, uh, of course. Thanks. A joy to be here with all of you and to gather with kindred spirits. Some I know, some I don't. Um, and so many of the words that Chandra and Carl have, have spoken uh, have just uh, resonated within me and brought me uh, even closer to the, uh, the joy within, to the light that I know that we all share. And it is that communing internally and externally that I find so nourishing in spiritual direction. Um, on my own journey, um, I, too, give uh, thanks to my parents and grandparents uh, for giving me the, the gift of faith. Uh, I was raised in a Lutheran um, home and church and uh, in Berkeley, California. And um, I married a, a Catholic and uh, looked for how to, to put my spirituality together because I had also come in touch with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross in graduate school. Um, and uh, so a very holistic understanding of human beings was bestowed upon me there. And as well as the sense of uh, the unity of consciousness. Um, and so I found the, the mystics within the Catholic church. And I said, oh, here are my people. <laughs> um, and uh, we had moved to, to Louisville. And so the, the spirit of Merton being here uh, was also a joy. So I also in college uh, learned to meditate as many of us did uh, when the Beatles brought transcendental meditation in. So I have meditated uh, since college and found the support of, of some of the Edgar Casey material early on and then throughout my, my life um, where uh, there is no one right church or religion. It's the one you practice. It is uh, finding and connecting with the God within, knowing that there's as much uh, life and space inside as there is out and it's continual, it's continuous. Uh, so, you know, with spiritual direction, I am so grateful that there are people who are also interested in speaking about what's happening. What is the spirit? How is the spirit growing us? Uh, how is the spirit bringing us together? How is this gift of life a, a gift, in fact, when sometimes it doesn't feel that way? Um, I am, I am also trained as a, a licensed clinical social worker. I've been in private practice for many years. And so relationships are, are sacred. 
Uh, and so the relationship with uh, our souls, with the God and divine, however you want to speak that, uh, is is as important as our family relationships. And yet our family relationships and, and relationships with our community uh, mirror what's happening inside and vice versa. And that's where I think spiritual direction comes into connection with, with community, um, is that how we, how we recognize that we treat ourselves is both based on how we've been treated and affects how we treat others. And so studying, knowing thyself, knowing ourselves, self-study, um, with another human being that says, hey, let's be kind. Let's hold kindness as a, a, a value and a, and a, and a path. Um, then we can be kind to others. Um, I'm, you know, at St. William, co-chair of the Compassion Ministry, uh, part of the Arms of Compassion um, that is, is spearheaded through uh, the Buddhist community, and many of you are part of that. That affects holding a, a field of compassion uh, for the city. Uh, it takes being knowing where your own center is and then holding it. So thank you. Thank you, Lois. Appreciate your words and look, look forward to hearing from you more. Linda Reynolds, thank you for being on. If you would introduce yourself. Hello, um, so happy to be here as well and um, to see new faces and old faces. And thank you for the invitation. Um, spiritual direction is dear to my heart. Um, I went through the archdiocesan program and graduated in 1999 and um, had had training originally as a uh, therapist. I had a master's in counseling psychology. And um, then I experienced spiritual direction and really um, it, it was such a rich experience for me that I looked into training and, um, and eventually got a master's in spirituality as well. For a time being, I was doing both counseling and spiritual direction, but um, it came to a point where I just really felt uh, wanted to solely uh, put my attention towards spiritual direction and um, just because it just felt most genuine to me and congruent in my life. Um, you asked some, such wonderful questions to reflect on quite a bit of, of uh, which was very helpful um, in terms of what spiritual direction is all about. Um, I really uh, appreciated what Chandra was saying about um, a person being able to strip away uh, all that, the outer layers and, and to um, experience the, the kernel. Um, and that really resonated with me because I think that's the joy uh, of being a spiritual director is really being able to sit with someone and listen to them, to be present to them and to see that uh, genuine self emerge over time and to really appreciate when you, once you see someone's genuine self, their, their, their heart, and you fall in love with them. I mean, they're just, it's just such a joy to see, even though, even within all the struggles and the pain, as well as the joy, uh, but to see and be with a, a person in, a, as our authentic selves together is quite quite an experience. And um, it, I really, in terms of the uh, question you asked about how spiritual direction connected with social change, uh, what came to me is that um, the, uh, the, the work of spiritual direction, uh, a lot of it is about really coming to know what our deepest, deepest desires and longings are because as the mystics tell us, Lois, um, um, our deepest, deepest desires of our heart, if we can connect to those, then we're connecting to God's desire for us. It's like um, God implants that desire in our heart, and then we notice it, and then we, pay, we choose to follow it or, or to lean toward it. And so we, we move with the invitation of the spirit. And I think... Um, I remember uh, reading Thomas Merton um, and a 
uh, he referred to uh, a Syrian monk named uh, Saint Dionysius. And the reason I remember this, it just struck me so much because uh, Dionysius referred to God as good, seeking good for the sake of good. And so I really believe that if, if we can um, get in touch with the deepest desires of our heart, and which is God's desire for us, then we can then participate in the loving work of God for ourselves and others and the world. You know, we can be a part of that good seeking good for the sake of good. So um, the spiritual direction, as I said, it's, it's, it's taking time to take that long loving look at the reality of a person's life um, to help them go deeper, to find meaning and purpose, to be able to, to discern how the uh, movement of the spirit is calling someone in, in small ways and in bigger ways depending on the, yeah, the season of their life. And um, to help them, um, I think Carl, you said listening um, to someone is, is a great gift. I think it is the greatest gift we can give. You know, just listening to another person and truly being present to them. And if that's all we do, that's, that's a great gift. So uh, I'm very honored to be a part of this discussion and this, this ministry. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Yeah, I appreciate your words. And we have one more. I don't know if you have to be a Linda in order to be a spiritual director um, or if there's some kind of gift that comes with the name, but uh, Linda Leeser, thank you for uh, being on and uh, please uh, introduce yourself. Maybe there's a secret Linda club that we haven't told you all about. <clears throat> well, um, I value the things that other people have said. Um, they resonate, and I just am proud to be part of a community that, that has directors. Um, when, Carl, when Judd asked us to participate, he sent us a set of questions, and <clears throat> I decided that I may write better than I speak spontaneously, so I'm going to give you some of the, the answers. Um, first. Uh, my entrance into the world of spiritual direction happened when I was a little girl. <clears throat> One day, my line of vision traveled from straight ahead and around to the upper reaches of my parents' tall bookshelf. And there, I noticed a set of six books with colorful covers with titles like Judaism, Hinduism, Catholicism, <clears throat> Protestantism, Buddhism, and Islam. I don't think I could pronounce the words, but they look more interesting than my father's books of engineering. That image stayed with me through the years of my upbringing as a Jewish child of German and Russian heritage. Somewhere along the way, it came to me that the borders between at least some of those books and what they represented was not as charming and friendly as I imagined, but they caught my curiosity. When I first heard the term spiritual direction, it delighted me the way other mysterious words did like vegetarian, rainbow, universal, God. I had a spoken hunch that there was a dimension of life that was not talked about and that maybe others like adults knew of it, but then I realized that maybe they didn't talk about it because they didn't know it themselves. I never seemed to be in the room when these words and concepts were discussed in my synagogues. I wondered if people actually could go deeper and do something with those words somewhere beyond everyday reality. <clears throat> I had another hunch somewhere along the way that religion and spirituality were not necessarily connected. As a director, I get to have conversations with people who want to understand those deeper dimensions in themselves. So for me, integrating ideas from other disciplines and traditions is one way I like to contribute to a directee's perspective when appropriate, and it isn't always appropriate. But I will offer bits of what I've learned from the Enneagram, Myers-Biggs, philosophy, world religion, and art making, especially making mandalas. 
These subjects helped identify and open doors inside to self-understanding. And I wrote more, but I think I'll stop there. That's beautiful, Linda. Thank you. And thanks for the, the forethought that um, went into that as well. The question that I'm uh, interested in, it also came up on the, the chat. Um, you know, spiritual direction's got kind of this, um, I don't know how long it's really been used in the, the American lexicon. I think there's a variety of ways in which the essence of what you do um, has been practiced in different cultures and different times, and they've probably given that different words. Um, but help us, um, and here I'm just gonna open it up to anybody that really feels called, um, inspired to, to kind of reflect on this question. But yeah, like, what do you do? What are you doing in spiritual direction? What are the practices that you use? What, what does that look like? How is that different than counseling? How's it different than psychotherapy or similar to psychotherapy? How's it different than coaching? You know, we've got these different kind of um, ways in which we tend the spirit out of different traditions with different names. So yeah, I would love to hear how you understand that. What are the practices you do? What does that look like for you? How do you understand it similar to those other modalities? Um, so that's a long question. And uh, anybody that feels inspired, please just unmute yourself and let's have some more conversation. I'll, um, I'll address the difference between um, my experience of the difference between therapy and spiritual direction. I think that's a question. So er most everybody asks when they first start spiritual direction and um, since I've experienced uh, being a listener in both modalities, uh, it's helpful for me just to describe it as, because um, people also, the other question people ask is, what do you bring to spiritual direction? And, um, you know, I don't want to, I don't uh, want to bring things that should be for a counselor or whatever. And I always say, don't worry about the content you bring, bring whatever is on your heart, because the spirit is in every area of your life. And the, what will happen is that I will listen differently as a spiritual director than um, I would listen as a counselor or a therapist. You know, uh, I'm listening for that movement of the spirit in, in someone's life. I'm helping listening um, for the kernels, the experiences, and helping them go deeper with that. I'm not listening to... Um, in, in therapy often, you know, there is kind of an end game. There's um, not, I mean, it's an ongoing end game, <laughs> but sometimes people bring things very specific, you know, that they wanna work on in um, therapy. That happens also in spiritual direction. They may come because they are um, wanting to discern life choices or moving in a different season of their life or grieving. There's a lot of reasons people would seek spiritual direction. But again, um, the way in which I was trained to listen as a therapist was more about um, uh, the, the modalities of, of therapy, you know, about in the psych psychological realm and, and their personal growth. I'm sure uh, Lois could speak more about all that as well. But um, so I just try to let, uh, introduce that so that people could relax into uh, whatever they're bringing um, and not be concerned about the content, uh, what's appropriate, because it's, it's all there. So. Thank you, Linda. Who else would like to address that question? Please. Yeah, I'll, I'll speak to that. Um, so, and I, uh, one of the things that we're listening for, I think, in spiritual direction is the deepest yearning of the heart. What, what is really the essentially, what, what, what are the important learnings that yearnings that we have? Um, and those are the yearnings for love, for connectedness, for, for um, uh, seeing beauty. Um, and when we listen uh, as spiritual directors, uh, Chandra said it earlier too, that so we, we move beyond the, 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 the surface stuff, the stuff of the ego, and we get down to what many spiritual directors, Sol Merton talked about as well, is, is the true self, our self, which is the um, reflection of the divine in all of us. Uh, so David's question is, is uh, again, how do we move 
uh, the, that came up in the chat is how do we move from uh, uh, that um, uh, outer self to the inner self um, um, through their attachment, yeah, to their personal and ego stories. In, indeed, it's uh, listening to that. And of, um, what a spiritual director does though, I, I said that earlier that um, uh, listening is an act of love. So we hold whoever we're talking to with deep gentleness and respect. We honor the whole personality, even I would say the ego personality, but we invite the person to look beyond the ego self, the small egoic self into what is really in their heart. Uh, again, the, the profound desires that make us human, the desires to love, to connect, to find beauty, to be interconnected. Um, and those are the, that's the conversation. So um, sometimes we, we use the Dr. Phil question when they, when they talk about an attachment or something, how's that working for you? Or how is that satisfying you? And at the end of the day, as they look deeper, they can begin to get in touch with, with something much more uh, essential to who they are. And um, so of course, it's also awakening to the, to the right now to who I am and to, and to the acceptance of who one is in the fullness of their being. So um, I'm, uh, it's been suggested by some of the other speakers too that um, uh, listening to the, to the soul or the inner self is, um, I really believe that um, we can find the truth and the depths of our heart because I do believe we are a reflection of the divine, the holy. And so really inviting a person to listen to their inner wisdom is, is a way that helps move from the ego, small egoic self to the, to the divine self that one is, is created, invited to be. Thanks, Carl. I, I'd like to um, follow up on that. I, do, I agree, um, Carl and Linda, with what you both said. Um, and I, I do think that the, the soul within is connected to, or the spirit within is connected to that, which is far beyond us as individuals. And then my spirit connects with yours, et cetera. One of the things that I found um, that happens, especially when we're going into very intentionally, I think this is one of the things that happens when we're doing spiritual direction or spiritual coaching even we are being very intentional about calling forth that which is or allowing space for for that which is beyond um our normal types of conversation and very often when we're in non normal conversation or we're in regular um, helping kinds of sessions um we're focused on what we can achieve we're focused on the transactional and in the space of spiritual coaching or, or, or direction, we really are focused on the transcendent within that is opening up for the transcendent beyond. And one of the things that I found to find to be extraordinarily powerful and important is silence. It's like silence is invited to be a part of the session. Silence is a member, just like every, just like the, the people that are involved. And um, in the silence, um, we, I've, I've found that insights emerge that would not certainly have emerged from me, you know, uh, and the, often people say that I wouldn't have thought of that before. Uh, but something else resides beneath our um, normal focus on uh, strategies and <laughs> uh, all of the kinds of, the, you know, the action steps we will take, et cetera, uh, when we are really in this, that, that other space. And I think that space informs what we can do when we get out and get ready to do strategy. Um, but it, it cannot um, be replaced by strategy. Thanks, and they Sean. go together in other words, I think. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, 
And again, I want to remind us as we're listening um, to actually practice what we're, we're thinking about. So those of us that are listening, you know, tend to your own heart, what's emerging in you. And there may be some questions that come out of that uh, here in a few minutes. We'll open that up. But Lois, uh, did you want to reflect, please? Yeah, I um, I heard some words as Chandra was speaking that are germane to uh, how I want to be with people, and and some of those are uh, were silence and space, and I would add safety. Um, that and. Uh, that I want to convey to people that it's safe to be themselves uh, and uh, that I will try to hold uh, with them a safe place to explore what it feels like to be alive in that moment um, because I think that's holy. Um, and that, that, that sense of slowing down and paying attention not only to um, uh, a spiritual movement, but even our physical bodies. You know, what are we, what is this life? I mean, if we are body, mind, spirit, emotion, you know, if we are continuous in our energies, then, then the body is sort of the slowest, densest expression of who we are. And so listening to that can often be easier than, um, discerning what does my heart want, <laughs> you know, in, a, in words, but to talk about my heart is beating fast. And um, there's, there's a sense of, of, of it wanting to, to pull out of my chest and connect with you or, you know, I mean, that's helping people to attend to themselves in a way that says it's okay to be who you are. Um, and let's see who that is and love who that is. Allow love to love us in this moment. And that takes being willing to slow people down and, and come out of the story and pay attention right here. And so I also like to support any meditative practices that people have, because I think it helps us to do that. Um, Thank you. Yeah, Lois. Linda, um, Lisa, do you have any um, thoughts or reflections there, things that you had reflected on earlier that you want to read? You're still on mute there, Linda. Uh, Chandra, I appreciated what you said about silence, and that's something that um, I'm learning more about. At some point in my work, I discovered how valuable it, it is just to sit in silence while um, letting the person know that I'm listening to them and following them, not zoned out. Um, and it's amazing what, what people will come up with when I stop teaching or, or chattering or whatever I used to do. Um, There are a couple challenges I, I'd like to bring up. Um, one is for me, early on, I wondered <clears throat> what I as a Jewish person could contribute to the spiritual path of someone else from another tradition, usually Christianity. And this turned out to be not such an issue after all, when I discovered that I was meeting with people who were coming to me, not in the name of religion, but to identify and claim a spiritual path of their own. And then I wanted to say something about trust and confidentiality. Um, but it seems like a lot of people come to direction not knowing the answers to these questions, maybe not ever having thought about them. And can they trust you <clears throat> with the questions that we ask? And then the, the other thing I wanted to say is that we live in a relatively small community and that makes confidentiality of paramount importance. 
the privacy of the relationship and what is shared between director and directee can really have an effect on a directee's capacity to trust. And if that trust is breached, that's they're going to carry that. So that's what I wanted to say. Mm. Yes. Thanks, Linda. Um, at this point, I'd, I'd kind of I would like to open it up to um, to those um, those that are on the Zoom call. Um, if you would like to unmute and kind of ask a question, or you know, kind of a question that may also come from something that's emerged in you while you've been listening, if you can kind of name that. Um, um, but anybody that's been that's been listening, um, Joppa, uh, you've got it. You put a a question and I would like if you don't mind unmuting Joppa you ask a, a question that I'm not quite sure uh, might be better articulated from you um, but if you would want to unmute Joppa and ask your question sure <clears throat> in listening to um, our panelists they have been describing um, <clears throat> certain tools like silence um, you know, listening as uh, ways to help um, uh, what wants to emerge in their relationship with others to emerge. And one thing that I am particularly interested in is um, um, how to, um, how can you bring that to certain other settings like institutional settings where our identities get in the way to help, um, um, agency emerge out of the relationships we're in rather than the identities we assume. And maybe how in a situation like that institutional setting as a teacher or office worker, you can bring some of these tools like silence, like listening deeply to enhance the agency that can emerge out of, out of the relationships you're having rather than your identities in the institutions. I hope that was clear. Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah, anybody just feel free to unmute that would like to kind of explore that further. I think, uh, let me just, uh, that's really kind of a soul centric city question is about how do these practices that we use for individuals translate to, you know, uh, collective space. Um, or at least that's how I was saying. Anybody like Chandra? Um, thank you so much for that question, Joppa, because um, I think it's a tremendously important question and one that um, we, maybe not even intentionally, but we just kind of sidestep that kind of question. Um, and I think it's fundamental to us being able to make real transformation. Um, so, I think calling it out becomes important. So if we're talking about a group, we're calling out the need for silence. We're making it um, part of the protocol, if you will, or the, the expectation that we will and we will include silence. So for example, sometimes when we're doing um, sessions here, we say that silence is a member of the circle in which we're engaging conversation. And so between each person, we ask for a minimum of 10 seconds of silence. And that in itself helps people to hear one another differently. I mean, it's not even a long period of time, but 10 seconds makes a difference. Um, and there's a, just, there's a sense of, there's an aura of respect and, um, and, a, and a vibration of something deeper than just self. You know, silence will, does speak. But silence is also very courteous. 
and waits to be invited. And so I just think we should call it out. Now, I will also say, and then I'll be quiet. I will also say people, that, there are some people, but not very many, but there's some people who have said, um, when I've, when, you know, maybe I'm, we're in, in a session and we said, well, let's just be silent for, um, we're gonna be silent for five minutes. And some people can hardly stand it. So, I, uh, and I'm sure that the other panelists have ex probably experienced that too. Um, there's, there's this rush to say something. Um, but once they get used to it, it's, it's a different story. Thank you, Chandra. I feel like we should give 10 seconds to just sit with that. How about some of our other panelists? What's emerging for you? What are you, what's showing up, Carl? Yeah, that's a challenging question. Thank you, Joppa, for it. And I'm, how, how that relates to me, I, I and mean, I'm hoping I'm hearing your question correctly. Uh, the words that came to my mind is it's about soul and not about role. Um, and I'll speak on my own uh, personal experience as an Episcopal priest. Uh, so uh, to step into an ordained ministry like that is an, an enormous role and sometimes a heavy weight. But I discovered that it was my task to be authentic in that role. Now the role sometimes served me well, but what I really needed to do was let my authentic being speak through that role. And uh, Chandra's words about silence is a way that I think people kind of step back from their roles or their posturing and they listen and they're still. Uh, my experience in a, in a parish ministry was when there was a heated conversation about the future of the church and different people had different points of view, how liberating it was to have a period of silence and people stop, got, were able to kind of disconnect from their, uh, their, uh, their outer self and really begin to listen with the heart. And that's an important part of what we do as spiritual directors. The great gift for me of spiritual direction too is, um, is to be, as I, as I listen to a person and I listen to what's in their heart and I listen to their struggles and their difficulties and their challenges. It awakens with me a deep, deep compassion. And that's what I think Chandra was talking about. I love what you said, Chandra, about um, the transcendent within, which helps us connect with the transcendence through all of us. Because when I can hear the person uh, listen to their soul, it awakens a compassion in me. And whenever we hear, I think, the deepest uh, story of a person, it evokes compassion. That's what it is to be human and to get to that place of compassion. And then as, as the spiritual director holds the person in compassion, the individual can begin to hold him or herself more in compassion and uh, begin to see in fact that we are all held in the compassion of this, um, uh, this, this cosmic flow of the, the, the universe. Uh, and that's how we move from that individual to the collective. We are in an interesting time because we are in a, in a time where the old answers are definitely not working. Institutions are under challenge. Uh, religious institutions, uh, faith traditions often don't seem to work for people the way they used to. The number of um, uh, religious people that identify as religious is going down while the number of people that consider themselves as spiritual is going up. So although we're in a time of great, great conflict, we're also in an important time to do the kind of listening that we're talking about today, to help people in their deepest seeking of the soul of spirituality, um, find that authentic place, that place of transcendence that connects all of us. Uh, anyway, I was kind of rambling there, so I'll stop talking. No, that wasn't rambling at all. 
One of the things that came up for me um, is this quote from Merton. Uh, we've mentioned Merton a lot. I'll just read it. In Louisville at the corner of Fourth and Walnut, in the center of the shopping district, I was suddenly overwhelmed with the realization that I loved all of these people. They were mine and I theirs, that we could not be alien to one another, even though we were total strangers. It was like waking from a dream of separateness. So that came to me while you were speaking, Carl. And What's, what's emerging? Let's kind of continue to nurture the conversation. Uh, again, if there's a question that's coming up or a, a comment from um, any of our folks that are on Zoom, feel free to unmute yourself and jump in. Uh, hi, I'm a, I'm a spiritual directee, actually not a director. I have been in spiritual direction off and on for the last uh, probably 40 years and currently in, in direction with one of the members of the panel. Um, the theme I hear coming through, um, and, and it hit me with uh, talking about um, spiritual direction providing a place of safety um, and, and silence is that spiritual direction is about providing um, um, a, spa a space where we can assuage um, our sort of um, ego fear, um, which is sort of always kind of controls what we think we're supposed to do or how we're supposed to think. Um, and so that it provides that space for, for, um, for letting that go so that we can go deeper into who we really are. Uh, the theme that came through to me, I, I think we're probably all on this discussion, either Christian or Jewish, but Judeo-Christian tradition is, you know, every time the angel shows up, it's like, fear not, fear not, fear not. Um, and I'm conscious about how, um, how strong a hold fear has in either trying to enter deeper into spiritual direction or, or, or getting or, or if we want to move from individual spiritual direction to what, how do we make a soulful city, um, finding some way to assuage that fear um, that we all have of sometimes fear of our own selves in addition to fear of the other. And how, um, I'm not sure, but, but, it, but I'm intrigued by thinking and reflecting on how um, the, the essence of spiritual direction could be utilized in order to, to, to um, sort of assuage fear in a larger corporate context. Um, I actually think it would be very difficult. Um, and, and sort of let the last thing is, is the discussions we had about silence. Um, we just do not live in a culture that values silence. Um, it's 24 seven news, um, people are uncomfortable um, Sandra said with silence, um, but we're also in the Judeo-Christian tradition know that, you know, God is in that quiet, silent voice. <laughs> um, so I think, it, I think we've got a big task ahead of us. And I'll just end with this. Sandra also talked about um, being peaceful and how sometimes being peaceful um, um, requires disruption, I think is the word you used. Um, and, and I think in a way, kind of corporately, humanly, um, we're in a very disruptive stage. And maybe that's not necessarily a bad thing. I'm not sure. Anyway, that's kind of reflections that came through my head. But I really appreciate this discussion. It's great. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. What good questions. I think that spiritual direction and fear, anybody want to, any of our panelists feel something emerge for them that you'd like to share, reflect on? Well, so, something popped up. Um, I don't know about the other panelists, but I've had the opportunity to um, have conversations with people who say they are atheist or agnostic. And I have to admit those conversations are maybe the most compelling because it reminds me that 
I can't make assumptions that if I use the word God, and I'm trying to be careful not to do that, that may have a completely different meaning to them. And I'm not here to proselytize or evangelize or even sell anything. Um, and then as far as our community goes, I, I think that to make ourselves soul centric, we have to find a way, I, I don't know if this is possible, but to reach out to the other that even though we are all different, we, we kind of speak a common language, but my neighbors don't speak that language. And how can I have a meaningful dialogue with them without getting into my rant, which I have to be careful of. Um, so that's all. Mm, thank you, Linda. Anybody else, panelists, wanna, what's stirring in you? Um, something that just came up for me when I was listening to Linda um, is the importance of not making assumptions. Um, and uh, in spiritual direction, we often talk about using a beginner's mind where uh, we're open to all possibilities and not an expert mind. And so the importance of if someone says I'm depressed, say, um, or I'm struggling, you know, they use a word not to even assume what that word means, Abby, to ask. So what does that mean to you? Um, you know, to, to really treat people uh, respectfully in that we're not going to put our assumptions onto the, to their lives and to help them come to that truth for themselves and listen with that beginner's mind. Thanks, Linda. Yeah, Lois. I love the, the way that these threads are weaving uh, here uh, because I um, treasure holding the I don't know place is what I call it, um, which is maybe a, a, a generic way of, of speaking of mystery, um, which is a word for the divine. Um, and it's, it's, it's being willing not to know and to, and to wait and, and trust. Um, and I think practicing in silence helps that. It's a way of coming out of the mind, which wants to know, and it will make up what it doesn't know, and it'll decide that's how it is, or how it was, or how it's going to be. And when we can drop in, I call more to the heart, or uh, to the mystery of saying, I don't really know how this is going to happen or what it's like or who I am, but this is what I experience now. Uh, and it, somehow that, that willingness not to know gives me strength and courage to face things I fear. Um, you know, fear is a powerful energy. And I find in my own life that the way that I best face fear is, is not to know, is, you know, that's that old acronym, fear is future events appear real. You know, I'm telling myself stories about what's going to happen that's awful, or, you know, what this disease in my body is going to mean for me or for the other person. Um, and if I can just come back to right now, where is, where am I? Where are we? How are we connected? Where is the light? <laughs> you know, what's the good? Where's love? How do I experience, you know, those things? Then we can face fear. I also think we face fear better together. When we feel connected, then we have strength that we don't feel when we feel alone and abandoned. Um, and so that relates too to the community piece 
is that we want to know more that that they're that we're here. <laughs> so so uh, let me yeah, add, Carl. That I appreciate that a lot, Lois. That was really helpful. And the dynamics of fear are really important, I think. I, I'm struggling with what fear does. And I know that fear can drive a person into isolation. But I also know what you, as you were saying, Lois, fear can um, be an opening place. I think about the, the awesomeness, the fearfulness that uh, the, the Bill, Bill talked about the, the, in the tradition that often the angel appears in a fearful, awful time when the, when the mysterium tremendum is there and says, fear not. So we can isolate, but we also can be open if we're sitting in that place of the not knowing that you were talking about, Linda. And in the sitting in the not knowing is to be present to the now and to have the courage to be present in the now and suspend that egoistic place and just to be open to what is. And that takes a certain amount of courage. Uh, cor courage is an important word for me because um, it, uh, it, it's derivation from the French queer heart. It means to have heart. And if we can have the courage to, to kind of sit in the now, uh, it's like the, the fear loses its power and we can embrace whatever is. It, it, extremely important in our time of transition because we don't know what's ahead for us. Uh, things are bubbling up in sometimes in most fearful way, I, I would say. And yet if we can have courage, if we can trust and know that, uh, I think also you said, uh, Lois, if we know that we're not alone, then we can we can go forward. If we can, as Chandra said, if we can awaken to that place where we find the transcendent within, and then we can find the transcendence among uh, that that can help us through our fear. Thanks, Carl. So I'll, I, I'll tag on to the, the mm, fear please. conversation here. It's really, uh, I think it's really rich and it, it, um, it makes me think of, um, so I wanna thank the, uh, first of all, I wanna thank William, for bring, William or Bill for bringing that up and for all of your other comments that have been stimulating something for me here. And it has to do with when we, Though we are fearful in silence, what I find is when I can go into that space when I am most silent, I mean, most fearful into the space of silence and, and have a conversation um, with, with the inner community. I, one of the people who informs me, uh, oh, so richly and so wonderfully is Howard Thurman. We've been talking a lot about Merton. Howard Thurman is my, he is a mentor, <laughs> um, posthumous mentor for me. Um, and one of the things he talks about is the inner community. And so the inner community is always active that's heart, mind, soul, will. And, you know, one might be dominating at a particular time that might keep us fearful. Um, and it's, it's how, part of what, what I'm always searching for is, is there a unanimous vote among the inner community? What's my heart telling me? Is it telling me the same thing as my mind? Is it telling me something? different from my soul? Is it aligning with my, you know, is my will out there doing its own thing <laughs> and everybody else's? And I'm not talking about a unanimous, but, uh, but uh, I mean, I am talking about unanimous. I'm not talking about a majority, okay? So I think within a, oneself, that becomes important. And I, as we have the conversation with, about the community, I suspect that that's partially important too. So if we were gonna say who, who's, which part of the community is really driving our conversation? Is it the mind of the community? Is it the heart of the community? Is it the will? I mean, what, what's going on? And how do we come to 
to some place of unanimous uh, agreement so that we can begin to do some of the more difficult work. But I do think that answering that kind of question really requires a lot of silence. And we have to confront the fears that we have. Mm. Yeah, thank you all. Really good wisdom. Again, I wanna invite the, um, those that are on Zoom, um, if you, want to share what's just coming up for you. If you have a question, comment, I'd love to, to hear uh, some more voices. This is uh, Rody, and I'm already a little hungry. I, I want us to sort of do this on a regular basis, you know, monthly, quarterly. I, this is very rich. So thank you all. Thank you, Rody. What else is showing up for people? What's what's inspired you? Or actually, just, look, okay, please go ahead. I could just say a quick word uh, to echo Rody's sentiment. Uh, this has been inspiring as in taking breath in, breath of spirit into my soul. All the, all the comments are rich and very helpful. And we somehow need to expand this conversation to include ultimately, I guess, the whole town, you know? So, uh, but one thing, I, I had just one little quick poem I could read in 15 seconds. And uh, I, was, I was reading Rilke a lot at a period of time in my life. And I wrote this little poem, just came out. I was searching for wisdom with Rilke as my guide. We walked through the darkness, right on through to the other side. We met Dylan and Cohen. They were searching too, outside the box. Choosing simple lines and melodies. They speak of pain and fear in the eyes of hate and scorn. They dance the gypsy campfire, casting visions in flames of desire, searching for words to say what words could never say. I think that's what we're doing. Amen. May it be so. John, thank you for being a, a community spiritual director through the ways you manifest and hold us and inspire us i think that's kind of my we've got about 12 minutes left and um i kind of like to do a check out um specifically with our panelists um you know i'm i'm really interested in the when we listen to spirit or soul um and it inspires us, there seems to be some way it wants to then manifest in the world. Um, often when I do Lectio Divina with people, a sacred reading, kind of one of the last questions I have is, what is this text or passage or poem inviting you to do or to be? Um, it's, it's like the spirit, once we touch the spirit, it then wants to re-embody in us. Uh, you know, it wants to manifest through us in something. And so I'm interested, uh, yeah, panelists, if you all could uh, take a, you know, 30 seconds, 45 seconds to check out, like what, what is this inspiring in you to do or to be or, uh, yeah, if you could make some final comments and, reflect on that and um let's go i'm going to call a call on you uh, let's go the way we started and um carl can you can you kind of begin our checkout if you're ready for that well uh, i find this conversation to be very inspiring and and uh i just want to reflect a little bit about um the last couple of years have been difficult 
for me and for many. Um, in with COVID and political turmoil and um, in, racial questions emerging, Breonna Taylor, all the stuff that's been going on. And um, uh, I was, uh, one of my mentors is Desmond Tutu, and he, uh, as you know, died two months ago. Uh, he's an Anglican Archbishop. He was an Anglican Archbishop. And he was helped me to hear again the words of hope as opposed to optimism. I mean, I'm not necessarily optimistic about how things are gonna turn out in the short term, but I'm very, very hopeful about um, um, the, the, the capacities of, the, of humans to find this inner light that we're talking about today. And I think that's what inspires me about this conversation. So as I feel like one of the things that I can do in this troubled world is listen to people and help them find that inner light. Uh, we, we, it's a, we look together, uh, you know, uh, we find our mutual wisdom and their looking at their inner light inspires me to find my inner light. Now that's on an individual role but I appreciate so much this conversation, Judd, because I do think we also, if Louisville is going to be a soul-centric city or the compassionate city that uh, many have wanted it to be, we need to listen to that inner light. And I, I'm hearing today too, that's again and again, the very important theme, we can't put ourselves in boxes. We need to look at the other who may have a very different point of view than I do, but can we hear the inner light of the other as well? And can we, uh, uh, in a sense, get our inner lights together and really um, emerge for forward as a soul-centric city that is, um, is speaking the, the, the values of truth and justice. So uh, that, th that's my thought. Thank you, Carl. Chandra, would you be willing to check out if you're ready? Um, well, I did, just would like to say um, this has been um, a nourishing conversation for me. And I really appreciate uh, all the comments that others have made. I do think that uh, like Carl, that we have many, many challenges um, and they're quite evident. We don't have to look far for, to find them. Um, I also have hope, Carl, that um, an expectation that we can address this but we have to, uh, I, I really believe that we have to um, address the fear, look it dead in the face and address it, you know. Um, and when somebody else is, is trying to, or when, when we're trying to grow and somebody stifles that, I think we just have to remember that we need to just keep going, not be deterred, um, but and and support one another. Support one another, because there are, I I think that there are a lot of people out there like the people who are here on, whether they're panelists or just on the screen who care. And we need to give one another the courage and support to keep going. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Chandra. May it be so. Lois, would you, are you ready to check out? Uh, thank you all uh, for uh, this, this rich time together. Um, and, and when I was hearing uh, Chandra and Carl, I, I am very moved by that sense uh, of hope and also of growing. I feel like the um, one thing that I hear over and over when I'm speaking with people is a, a level of questioning of what are we here for? What, you know, I'm not sure anymore what my purpose is if I'm all alone in my home due to COVID. 
I'm not sure what, what I'm, you know, about here. And I think that sense of growing, of um, always knowing that we're, we can learn something. And coming together today has been a great learning, very nourishing, as you said. Um, and I'm, I'm very grateful. I think that um, willingness to explore who the other is, to question, to find out, to love when it's hard, um, even when that other is within, um, is a lot about what uh, this is about. So thank you. Thank you, Lois. Yeah, appreciate you being here and sharing your presence and wisdom. Linda Reynolds, would you mind checking out? Thank you. Yes. Um, thank you. Uh, I have also enjoyed this conversation so much. Um, really touched by um, what people have shared. And um, that, uh, I guess, checking in with myself as I check out, <laughs> I um, what I'm appreciating is or taking uh, it's on the uh, taking with me is that role, um, not the role, but the soul. I really appreciate Carl, you bringing that up um, because uh, in this moment I'm realizing um, my comfortableness and uncomfortableness, uh, my uncomfortableness with being in the role of spiritual director and and um, you know how that brings some fear or resistance to being seen in a role and how the experience as we we stayed with this conversation, my heart just was opening up and just being present to what I was hearing from each other. It was touching my soul and I felt that there was a soul connection among us and how rich that is. And there's, and also how there's not a fear in that, um, that, that the fear was more out of the place of role and not soul. Mm. And so I really appreciate that. Thank you everyone. Mm. All your comments. Thank you, Linda. And uh, final checkout, Linda, Lisa, thank you so much for being on today. There's so much value in trying to find our people and <clears throat> the thought of the possibility that we are adding some light to the world makes me more hopeful. Thank you, Linda. Well, the, the close, um, one of my, well, I'm just, I close with a, a very grateful heart um, to the panelists for giving your time and the work you're doing and, um, one of the ideas behind the soul centric city is that um, it, it takes a that form form follows consciousness. Um, it takes uh, a group of people coming together that resonate um, with one another to create different structures, different realities. Um, and I really feel like the you know the tribe may not be a best word, but the quickening of people uh, finding one another. Uh, one of the ideas is that Louisville has everything it needs for everyone to thrive. We just need to be more connected to ourselves. Um, and you could say little person self, or we could say selves, all of us. And that's really what the soul centric city is about. And it just brings me so much joy. Um, that, the, that there are all of these resources in Louisville, you all, um, to, to guide us and share your wisdom and be present with us um, for the city that wants to emerge. I mean, we, there's a lot of that we can't control, just like spirit. We don't know what spirit is about often. And so, but we can create a big enough heart, a big enough container where the city that wants to emerge uh, can do that through us and in us. And, so I appreciate everybody that was on the call and all of you that joined in. Um, I do want to give a plug for next week. Uh, we have a, a 
interfaith panel, interreligious panel, uh, talking about what is the soul from different religious traditions. So we've got um, Catholic, Protestant, uh, Hindu, Buddhist. It'll be a really rich conversation on on the concept of the soul and how that functions in different religious traditions. So hope you'll uh, join us for that. And then on the last um, Tuesday of the month, we're going to have a conversation with organizational directors, spaces uh, that and places and spaces that are cultivating the soul. So Earth and Spirit Center will be with us. Um, St. Francis um, uh, in the field, uh, St. Francis uh, in New Albany, um, their spiritual retreat center. We've got somebody even coming in from um, um, the Sisters of Loretto um, to talk about the sacred space down there. I don't know if any of y'all have been to the Cedars of Peace, but uh, they do some beautiful work. So we're going to hear from kind of retreat spaces and organizations uh, that are doing that work. So hope you'll come back on Tuesdays and join us um, for, um, yeah, different wonderful conversations. Oh, and somebody, uh, yes, uh, I'm uh, uh, next week, uh, Linda, we do have a, a rabbi that's going to be on the panel uh, speaking from the Jewish tradition, Rabbi Ben Freed, who's one of a new new rabbis here in Louisville. So he will be uh, speaking from the Jewish perspective. So thank you all so much. A deep bow. You're welcome to unmute yourselves. And let's do that kind of concophony of thank you. Appreciate you all. Bye bye. All that stuff. So in, uh, unmute thank yourself you. and let's say goodbye to each other. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. you. Amazing, like amazing people. <laughs> Namaskar. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Namaste. Yes. yes. Namaste. Good to be with Namaste. you.